Just half an hour's drive from Oxford through lovely Berkshire countryside lies the Royal Military College of Science. The 736 acres of ground, some of which is farmed, provide ample space for college houses, for halls of residence for single members, and for sports fields. The army of today needs many officers with a good scientific and technical background. Here, serving army officers are given courses in the pure and applied sciences. Among the students, there's a sprinkling of officers from our Navy and Air Force and from the Commonwealth. Also, there's a small but increasing number of civilian students. This fishing lodge, or Chinese summer house, was built at the end of the 17th century and is the oldest complete building on the site. This is Beckett Hall, which will long be remembered by many ex-students for the college summer balls, which overflow onto the surrounding lawns and down to the nearby lake. The courses given in these buildings range in length from weeks up to three years, the latter being degree courses. One 12-month course of postgraduate standard invariably has students from all three armed services and from industry. Some of the college staff live in these and other houses in the college grounds or perhaps further afield in this Wiltshire village up on the Downs, in fact the highest village in the county. Driving to the college can be a most pleasant way to start the day. No rush hour traffic is encountered on these country roads, although one may occasionally be delayed by cows. The driver of this car is a member of the teaching staff in the chemistry department of the Royal Military College of Science. Today he has no teaching duties. And as he drives to the college, he is probably thinking about research. The college expects its staff to engage in active research as befits an institution of higher education. This man is interested in the chemistry of life, that is, biochemistry. In particular, he is interested in enzymes. Enzymes are substances which enable chemical reactions to take place in living organisms at the relatively low temperatures at which animals, plants, bacteria, etc. exist. Some of the chemical reactions performed by these enzymes defy duplication by the chemist in his laboratory. Others can be carried out in the test tube, but only under more severe conditions, for example at high temperatures which would kill living material. In other words, enzymes are naturally occurring catalysts. Arriving at the college, a telephone call is made to the nearby bacon factory to verify that pigs are to be slaughtered today. Pigs are to be slaughtered today, and arrangements are made to obtain the kidneys of some ten pigs as soon as possible after they've been killed. An enzyme will be extracted from these pig kidneys and it's desirable to remove the kidneys from the carcasses as soon as is practical and so minimize any changes that might occur after the death of the animals. A container of crushed ice has been brought to keep the kidneys in good condition for the journey back to the college. At the moment, these pigs are alive. What is this condition described as being alive? Many biochemists think that in living creatures such as these, life can be completely described in terms of a vast complex of interrelated chemical reactions controlled by a central nervous system. But the functioning of the nervous system itself probably consists of still more chemical processes. When an electric voltage is applied across the head of the pig, the chemistry of the brain is influenced and the pig becomes unconscious. This effect on the pig is temporary and the animal would eventually recover consciousness. 
The painless bleeding of the unconscious pig causes a drastic termination of many of the chemical reactions of life and death results. The object is to extract and purify substances from organs of the dead animal and attempt to bring back to life, as it were, some of the chemical processes which stop when a living system dies. Meanwhile, we wait while the carcass is cleaned. The skins of the carcasses are slightly charred in an oil furnace so that a clean surface is readily obtained by mechanical scraping. The carcass having been opened and checked by an inspector, the kidneys are now removed from the pigs that were alive a mere quarter of an hour ago. In order to keep the kidneys in their original fresh condition, they are placed in the container of crushed ice. The required parts of the kidneys are removed and placed in ice to be taken back to the college. This well-insulated door shuts out heat from a tiny laboratory that is cooled like a refrigerator. The temperature in here is kept slightly above freezing point so that biological material can be kept fresh while various procedures are carried out. A butcher's electric mincer is used to break down the tissue into small pieces. The minced material is roughly weighed into portions for adding to the homogenizer. The solution added with each portion is to adjust the acidity of the mixture. The rapidly rotating cutting blades in the homogenizer break down the tissue still further so the material has a thick creamy texture. The temperature of the ice-cold material is rapidly raised by placing it in a bath of very hot water. If the conditions are carefully controlled, the required enzyme remains in solution while the protein impurities are denatured just as an egg solidifies when it is boiled. The temperature must not be permitted to get too high, however, so the mixture is transferred to another bath which is thermostatically controlled to prevent the temperature rising any further. After a carefully timed interval, the temperature is rapidly reduced by cooling the material in crushed ice. The required biologically active substance will be damaged if heated for too long. But other protein impurities are even more sensitive to heat and these solidify. This instrument measures the acidity of the cold material and this is now adjusted before again rapidly raising the temperature for a further period. The degree to which impurities can be congealed by heating and later separated without damaging the enzyme has been previously determined by experiment in which the degree of acidity, etc., were varied. After cooling, the material is poured into centrifuge bottles. The bottles and their contents have to be balanced before being rapidly spun in the centrifuge.
the speed is adjusted to a few thousand revolutions per minute. The protein impurities that have been solidified by the heat treatment are forced to the bottoms of the bottles. The clear solution being poured off contains the enzyme which has been extracted out of the kidney tissue. This solution, however, is still very impure as can be seen by its colour, the pure enzyme being yellow. A calculated amount of a salt is added to the solution. The solution is stirred to dissolve the salt and becomes very cloudy. This cloudiness is the required enzyme, which can now be separated from the clear solution of impurities by centrifuging once again. This time, it is the solid material packed at the bottom of the centrifuge bottles that is required. On adding a solution of the correct acidity, the enzyme dissolves, and we now have it concentrated in a much smaller volume. The whole process of heat treatments, acidity adjustment, centrifuging, addition of salt and further centrifuging must be repeated. We now have a smaller volume of still purer enzyme, still not yellow however. It will be necessary to carry out the whole cycle of heat treatment, etc., yet again. The kidney extract has now been purified down considerably. Contaminating salts will be removed from the preparation by placing it in a bag of semi-permeable membrane which allows the salts to pass through into the surrounding solution while leaving the enzyme inside the bag. The bag is cut open and the enzyme added to the top of a column packed with absorbent material and allowed to soak in. On washing the yellow enzyme down through the absorbent with a solution of accurately adjusted acidity, the impurities are left behind by the process known as chromatography. The solution dripping from the bottom of the column is collected in a test tube which is periodically replaced. The yellow colour of the solution in the test tubes in the centre of the rack probably indicates the presence of purified enzyme. A sample is taken and its absorption spectrum is measured in ultraviolet and visible light. The curve obtained is certainly characteristic of the enzyme, so further tests are made. As all enzymes are proteins, a measurement of protein content is made. Measured amounts of reagents are mixed with samples and also with a solution containing no enzyme for comparison. A blue colour deepens according to the quantity of protein present. The samples are placed in a warm water bath to speed up the complete colour development. The colour due to the samples is compared with that containing no enzyme by measuring the amount of visible light absorbed at the wavelength producing the blue colour. We now have a purified solution of a substance that was extracted from the pig kidneys. Under suitable conditions, will this substance, so to speak, show any life? Let's try and see. Enzyme samples are placed in special flasks with side bulbs protruding from them, and a substance with which the enzyme is thought to give a living reaction is placed in the side bulbs. The flask is connected to a long U-shaped tube containing indicator liquid. The level in each limb of the U-tube can be measured on the calibrated scale to which it is attached. 
The flasks are warmed by a bath of water thermostatically kept at blood temperature. Many similar flasks containing enzyme samples can be warmed to blood temperature at the same time and mechanically shaken. The flasks are tilted and the enzyme mixes with the substance in the side bulbs. The closing of this tap seals off the air inside the apparatus. The change in level in the indicator tube shows that oxygen is being consumed. Did the death of the pig mean nothing more than the cessation of many such reactions when oxygen was no longer transported to the kidney and other organs by the blood? The consumption of oxygen catalyzed by this enzyme, which perhaps represents a small part of what we call life in the pig, can also be measured electrically. This mechanical pen is drawing a fairly straight line as the chart moves beneath it, showing that no oxygen is being consumed in the apparatus. Enzyme is added to the flask and the pen moves over to the left as to a very humble extent a chemical reaction of life is reproduced. When no oxygen remains, the pen levels out once more. From this graph one can readily determine rates of oxygen consumption under varying conditions. There can be no ending to this for many other fields at the rodage of science.